All right, well, everybody's still filing in. I uh, just want to get started here. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. want to make sure that we have enough time. So uh, this is the session that we're going to talk about, best practices for design and performance in SharePoint Online. If you're here to listen about, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about branding. We're going to talk a little bit about how to create portals and make sure that they're, they're performant. Uh, the focus of the presentation is really going to be on, uh, we're, going to, we're going to primarily talk about SharePoint Online. But if you don't happen to be on SharePoint Online, a lot of what we're talking about is going to be applicable to SharePoint On-Prem as well. So it's just lots of, uh, lots of best practices. But as you'll see in a second, that's kind of going to be, um, you know, going to be a little bit more important. Some of the stuff that we're talking about is, uh, you know, for if you are in the SharePoint Online uh, uh, arena. All right. I haven't used this thing. So. Um, so like I was saying, in this session, we're going to be providing guidance for successfully building portals on SharePoint Online. So at the beginning, a little bit of talk about uh, you, you know, how to make sure that you plan and understand the differences to moving to the cloud. We're going to talk a little bit about different flavors of cloud. We're going to talk about some of those things. Moving on, and we're going to talk about SharePoint Online's scalability and, and how they handle their, their scaling and, and their strategy for, uh, for new loads and, and things to make sure that you all have a great experience, no matter how many users are going to be hitting your portal. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, and at the end, we're going to share some real experiences about how Microsoft uh, builds out uh, builds out large and does large portal uh, large portal launches. So um, hopefully, everybody can stick around. We have some uh, we have some good uh, some good announcements that are coming at the end. So if any of you are kind of wondering about the the future of branding in, in SharePoint and SharePoint Online. Stick around, so we got some interesting stuff at the end too. So that's not on the slide, but uh, good stuff. So I want to introduce myself before we get too far into it. My name is John Ross. I'm a product manager at Rackspace. Uh, some of you may be wondering, hey, this is a guy at Rackspace, and he's talking about SharePoint Online. Well, you know, Rackspace, Microsoft, good friends. We we do we do all things, including SharePoint Online, Office 365. Uh, so that's one of my areas as a product manager that I'm covering. Uh, I'm an MVP for SharePoint Server. Um, written a few books, um, including one on 2013 branding. Um, we were giving them away earlier in the week, so if you happen to uh, be someone that's interested in, in picking up a book, I think we have a couple left, so come, come, find, come, come find us in the, in the Expo Hall. Um, blog, Twitter, reach out. Uh, always love to interact with people. And I'm from uh, all the way over in uh, a much warmer place in Orlando, Florida. So. Uh, it's lovely down there. I'm sure, hopefully you guys can all come visit, visit me at WPC in, in July. So I'm Randy Driscoll. Uh, I'm, I'm a manager at Rackspace uh, and the token uh, SharePoint UI guy as well there. I share a lot of the same uh, specs as John does. MVP for SharePoint Server, wrote a bunch of books. There's my blog, my Twitter. I let you live about 12 minutes away from John. So, you know, we collaborate uh, at the Chipotle uh, near our houses a lot. It's shocking how much Chipotle we've eaten. It is. It's, well, maybe not if you look at me. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I like to say, like, at least for this session, like, I'm the guy who's been doing, like, on-prem SharePoint branding for a long time. And now I'm starting to, you know, get more into the, on, uh, you know, SharePoint Online, the cloud-based uh, based SharePoint and 365, that kind of stuff. And so while I have a lot of experience on the prem and a little bit in the cloud, uh, we're going to introduce uh, Sham here, who's got a lot more experience with being able to talk to how performance is impacted in the cloud. So my name is Sham Narayan, and I'm a program manager on the SharePoint Online team at Microsoft. I work on the core engineering team that's responsible or owns the storage, networking, and compute infrastructure that powers the service. And my team also owns the performance of the service. Like John and Randy, I've been a SharePoint guy for a long time worked in the field, and I work on the core engineering team. Hit me up on Twitter happy, with all your questions, feedback, comments. Happy to hear from you folks. And I'm not in Orlando. I'm actually based out of <laughs> Seattle, Washington. How many minutes away are you for now? Yeah, we'd, a few we'd, more minutes. <laughs> we'd, we haven't yet had burritos with Sean, but no. uh, hopefully that'll change we should. someday. So I, I kind of want before we jump into this, I just want to say, um, you, you know, kind of a little story. Um, before, before we got into presenting this session, uh, when we were asked about it, um, you know, a, a lot of our, uh, uh, we were kind of thinking, well, you know, how are we going to bring branding and performance and everything together? And I think that um, 
especially as it relates to SharePoint Online. And so Randy and I kind of approached this presentation with some skepticism, and I think that there's, um, there's been some, uh, you know, people have come up to us and said, and said similar things. But um, hopefully as we go throughout this session, I think um, we want some of the conversations that, uh, that Randy and I have had with Sham and, and his team to come out. I mean, we, uh, we, we've, we've been very honest and very candid to make sure that uh, we're passing the feedback that we hear from, from you all to say, you know, to say, hey, when we do this session, I know that there's a lot of things that people are going to want to hear. And, and I think that, uh, you know, we feel really great about some of the conversations we've had and, and uh, you know, so I'm excited about this session, a lot of good information, but, you know, when you start thinking about going to the cloud, cloud means a lot of things. You know, cloud is probably the most pervasive buzzword in IT over the last couple of years. And so, especially for people that are looking on, and they're thinking on SharePoint, you know, uh, most everybody has been living in this on-prem world. Everybody says, okay, I'm the CIO, we're going to go to the cloud in the next year. What does that mean, right? So I like to define cloud as saying you're running your implementation or your servers on, on in somebody else's servers. That's the most simple definition. So there's lots of different flavors of cloud. When we talk about SharePoint Online specifically, we're talking about a SaaS-based solution, which is software as a service if you're not familiar with the lingo. Uh, Azure is an infrastructure as a service solution. So that's something where you're virtually running in the cloud. Both of them are clouds. So, um, you know, it's important to make the distinction when you say, I want to go to the cloud, it can mean lots of different, it can mean lots of different things. The focus of this presentation is going to be focused on running things in the, in SAS, the SaaS-based solution that is SharePoint Online. But, you know, it's, it's important to note that if somebody does say, you know, if, if your boss does happen to say, we want to go to the cloud, you know, make sure you understand what you're talking about. Not all clouds are, com are created equal and make sure that, uh, that whatever, uh, whatever cloud you're moving to is going to fit your business case. And so and as, it's, it's an important thing to talk about because when, when, you're going to, and when you're going to a cloud solution like SharePoint Online, there's different things that you have to think about. So that's where we bring to this slide. Why is running in the cloud different? So for most of you, and, and for Randy and I, we've been living in this on-prem world, and this is kind of what our on-prem world looks like. We've got a server that's running, sitting in a data center down the, or a, a, a closet down the hall, and it's, you know, we've deployed a custom portal that's got web parts and content and all this other stuff. Um, you hit it with a browser. For the most part, you know, everybody in the company is us using company-issued machines, same browser, you know, we can control a lot of things. Um, when you develop those portals, if you have any problems with any, any types of uh, performance or anything, it's pretty easy to go, you know, tell the IT guy, hey, it's running slow, go down and, like, jiggle the wire on the router and make it go faster or, you know, clean stuff up. You're talking about something that has a, uh, you have a very high bandwidth type connection to, uh, to your servers and, you know, very low latency. So when any problems uh, you can kind of mask some of the problems with some of your customizations. It's pretty easy to just, you know, nobody notices that if things aren't perfect. But as you move forward to something like SharePoint Online, the architecture is different. So now instead of just having one server down the hall, you're talking about SharePoint Online, which behind the scenes is running hundreds of servers. And so all of those little things that you may have created in your custom portal, like we're seeing there, all of those little pieces of latency are compounded. So any of those little things that you could get away with because we had a high bandwidth connection down the hall, I don't have an IT guy that can go, you know, run over to the Microsoft data center and jiggle cables on, on routers and things like that. So it's different. When you're thinking about planning, this is a key, this is a key takeaway. When we were having discussions with Sham, this is one of the, this is when a light bulb went out for us to say, oh man, you're talking about latency. We want to minimize the amount of requests that are going back to the server. We, there's so many different sources of latency all across the type of custom portals that you're making. We want to make sure that, you, you know, we, we pay attention to all of those little pieces that could potentially cause our users to have a, a bad experience. So for all these hundreds of servers that we have that are serving, serving up our portal on SharePoint Online, um, you've got to consider that you've got, you don't just have a cable running down, running down the hall. Now you've got the internet right in between you. So you've got something where 
um, you, you know, the performance is going to be based on your connection to the internet. So if things, network conditions on the internet or, you, you know, everybody is like watching the live stream of our, of our presentation here, it's slowing everything down probably. So, I mean, all of those types of things are, are things that you have to plan for. So being able to make sure that you maximize and make your implementation as tight as possible is really going to help to make sure your users have a great experience. So in this example that I'm showing you here, is, you know, you're talking about all the servers, you're talking about the internet in between, as well, and, and your page, hopefully, if you set it up properly, is going to be also pulling from a lot of different places like CDNs and, and such. But another thing that you have to consider is that when you move to a cloud-based solution, another thing that is, is important is, ideally, we're going to be thinking about our customers or our users accessing this portal using a number of different devices, whether it's mobile, tablet, various browsers, um, so all of these things play into, play into it, which means that when you go through the process of creating your custom portal, you've got to plan a little bit better for all of these different scenarios. Before, it was, it was just, like I said, it was a little bit easier. You know, down the hall, everybody, everybody kind of had a homogenous uh, platform and we were good to go, but things are changing now and we got, uh, got a little, little bit more things to think about. For me, one of the big things to think about was like the caching, because like, when you're on-prem, you have a few servers, you can cache a lot of stuff. When you're uh, in the cloud, you're going to have a lot of servers, so if you hop from server to server, you won't have that cache. You spend all the time building up the cache, and that's something Sham's going to talk about later in the presentation as to how to sort of mitigate some of that stuff. And also a couple of things, like you spoke about users using their own devices. Also, we have no control over what networks they're coming over. Mm -hmm. So that plays into latency, and we need to keep that in mind, how are our users connecting to the service. Yeah. I mean, any time that you're creating something and there's various cache misses, misses or whatever along the way, you've got all these different devices that are, you know, all these servers that are in the cloud. You know, these little, these little things compound because there's so many of them. So where do you start? You know, you, you've really got two options of where you can start. Um, you've got, you kind of just start from scratch. You can just start Greenfield. You can start from, say, you know what, we're going to go to the cloud. We're not really going to worry about what we've done in the past. We're going to start brand new and fresh. And I think that that's, that's, what, a, uh, that's what a lot of people that I'm hearing about, because um, I've been to a number of customers that they show me their, their portals, and they're like, this is garbage. You know, this is terrible. Um, you know, I think uh, Dan Kogan, I was in his session, uh, I, I think it was at the last SharePoint conference where he was talking about, like, the 1996 portal or something like that that everybody, that everybody uh, made. And I, I see that a lot of places where people have these really old, crusty portals, and they're like, you know what? Let's not even try to move it. Let's just start over fresh and put all the good stuff there. Um, it's a good strategy. But then other people have already been on, say, SharePoint 2010, and they're looking to go to SharePoint Online, and they've got some important data that they need to get up there. How do you, ma how do you get your on-prem data into SharePoint Online? How do you do that? Well, ideally, what you want to think about, I, li I like to use the analogy of moving. I just moved about a year ago. And you know, if you have a house that is not perfectly organized and you have a bunch of clutter or whatever, there's a bunch of junk that I didn't want to move to my new house. So I said, you know what, we're going to clean out the junk that, that, that we don't really use because it's, you know, we don't want to spend the extra effort moving it. And then when we get to the new house, we want to make sure that we, we understand and we have a place for all of the things that we are moving. So that idea about how you're going to clean up clean up your old data, and make sure that when you do move your old legacy data into, into your new pretty home in SharePoint Online, you want to make sure it has a place to go, it's well organized, and it's set up. So this idea of thinking about, you know, cleaning up your content, but you also want to make sure that because of the capabilities of SharePoint Online, it's a little bit different, probably from some of the old versions, you want to re-architect your solution to best take advantage of what SharePoint Online has to offer. So that idea of, of thinking and planning is going to be, you know, I want to keep making sure that we hammer this home a little bit, that, that things are, you know, there's, there's different capabilities and different things up in the cloud. We want to make sure that we're taking advantage of it. So uh, the planning process is going to be a little bit, is going to be important and, you know, maybe a little bit different from the planning process that you've gone before. So here's kind of this, um, uh, this little chart that we put together that kind of talks about what the process is going to look like. So I just kind of talked about the planning. We want to make sure that we go in and we think about all of the things that we want to do. We want to kind of plan it on paper. And there's, I, I used to be a business analyst. That was my official, official title. And, you know, I used to tell people, 
you know, we can, we can, make, our, we can make our projects go 33% more, uh, more efficiently and, and more quickly by doing effective planning. And, you know, I don't know if that metric is still true, but the point is, is that it's a whole lot easier if we can think through everything that we want to accomplish. What are our goals? What are our success criteria? What are the key things that we need to have SharePoint do for us to make sure that uh, we account for them and plan for them in SharePoint Online and, and make sure we're hitting that so that, you know, we want our users to have, to be able to come in, do their work, collaborate in the way that they, that, that can get the most value and the best return on, on investment for, uh, for people. So it's important to do your planning, understand what's, uh, understand what's involved. And then once you plan everything out on paper, these, uh, these other ideas in the middle where you have the, br uh, the branding, the site build and configure and the other, that's really your, your construction. So your branding, site build, and these other, these other aspects can kind of happen in parallel. So a lot of times when Randy and I used to build sites, Randy would go off and he would do kind of the branding at the same time the developers would do their work at the same time that I would work with on creating information architecture and, and uh, you know, the taxonomies and all this other stuff. So they all kind of happen in parallel. Um, and ideally what's going to happen, if, you, if it all comes together, you're going to finish that all those, all those pieces in the center at the same time. And you're going to get to a point where you're going to say, all right, now we're getting ready to flip the switch. We're going to, the, con uh, the, the structure is there. We're going to start loading the content. We're going to get ready to a point where we're going to talk about rollout, flip the switch, and everybody's going to come on. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the rollout piece. Um, but this is kind of a sort of overarching idea about sort of how this uh, talk is going to be structured going to breeze through the planning, talk a little bit about the stuff in the middle, and then at the end, Sean's going to talk about, uh, you know, some, of the, some, some rollout strategies and, uh, and, and clarify some of that. But when you're thinking about your design and you're thinking about planning your design, there's a few things that you want to consider. Um, cloud parity is one of them. Um, and, and what this is talking about is kind of what I was alluding to earlier. What you've done online and uh, what you've done on-prem with SharePoint 2010 or even SharePoint 2013 might be a little bit different from what's available in SharePoint, in SharePoint, uh, in SharePoint Online. So um, it's not guaranteed it's going to be exactly the same. So you've got to think about that and make sure that everything that you're, uh, that you're, that you're doing, you want to make sure that, uh, y you know, what is your goal? Understand, is, you know, is the... Maybe the old way that you were doing things isn't, the, isn't the, the best way moving forward. How can you take advantage of the rich new functionality? Um, you know, and, and a lot of these other things, I mentioned devices um, in the cloud. The idea is, you know, we'd ideally like our cloud to be device agnostic, whether you're on a laptop, a desktop, tablet, phone, you know, whatever platform you happen to prefer or your users are, are using, you know, if you're, if you're going to be supporting all the devices or less devices, you've got to make sure that you've got a plan for that. So the more devices you're going to support, and I mean, this is another thing we've talked about a lot, the more devices you're going to support, the more, uh, if you're going to do responsive, it's going to factor into how complex or, or the needs of your design. Uh, and, and again, connectivity. We want to make sure that we keep reminding you guys that especially whenever you're in the cloud, you're, you've got this thing called the internet in front of, in, in the middle, and so, uh, you got to make sure you got a good pipe. You got to make sure that you've got a re good, reliable connection because your users are going to be sad if your ISP is not reliable and goes down. If you have like the ISP, like I have at my home, that I have en that I've griped endlessly about, it's not uh, it's not Microsoft's fault that I can't get to SharePoint Online. It's um, my terrible internet provider. <laughs> but uh, so I hit the button. There we go. So. When we, when we get into building portals on SharePoint Online, this is where we're going to talk about, this is where we're going to start talking about branding. And this is, if you've come and, and, and listened to Randy and I talk in the past, um, we like to set the stage by saying, what do we mean by branding? And I wanted to start here by saying, you know, when we talk about branding, branding is usually a marketing term where we're talking about just, you know, creating names, logos, symbols. I mean, it's usually kind of, it's kind of a, a generic marketing term that just refers to fluffy stuff. Once we start taking that onto the web and we talk about branding in SharePoint, we're really talking about SharePoint-specific things, master pages, page layouts, 
it's really user experience. It's user experience design and, and user experience development. It is everything that you see on the page that is rendered to the user and how they interact with it really is, is a part of branding. And so that's why a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, it's not just fluffy stuff where we're not just saying, hey, here's how you change the colors and all that other stuff. The whole design that you create and the user experience that you're presenting to your users is going to have a direct result or the way that you approach that is going to have a direct result on performance and making sure you do that the right way could be the difference between your users having a great experience and a experience that uh, leaves them a little bit sad. So uh, I think another thing that we want to make sure that we level set on is that when we think about branding in SharePoint, we think about two, th we think about two types of sites. We, th we think about portals and we think about collaboration sites. Portals are the ones like your corporate internet page. They're highly styled, highly branded. Usually you've got um, a small number of contributors and a large number of consumers. You're, you're basically, uh, it's, it's largely going to be uh, read-only content where, you're where your users are going to go in. They're going to they're consume the information. They're going to move on to other parts of the portal. Um, so those areas are going to be the things that you're going to, you know, focus more. There's going to be a stronger branding UX aspect to these pages. The other types of, of pages and sites that you're going to have are the collaboration sites. And this is where your users are going to go to do their work. And really what's, you're, you're probably going to have way more collaboration sites than you're going to have the portal sites. But, uh, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be the places where content is more important than the look and feel. You still usually want to have, you know, some amount of branding on the, on the collaboration sites, but a lot of times you really want the branding to kind of get out of the way. We've had some customers that have come and said, you know, oh man, we got this great brand and we want to make sure it's in our collaboration sites. And so they end up with like these gigantic images and everything in their master pages and their users see it and they're like, can that just get out of the way? Because we, we want our users to be, we want to just do work. And, you know, it's a third of the screen is being taken up by this ridiculous banner that does nothing for me. So, you know, <laughs> in collaboration sites, we want the content to be front and center. That's where people are going to go get work done. Portals, highly stylized. That's where you're going to do, that's where you're going to do your communication. And that's where you're going to be, uh, it's kind of like, you know, your internal landing page where everybody's going to go. So, and again, if you've seen Randy and I talk, we've been talking about this approaches, approaches to branding for a while. Um, this idea where we have low effort, medium effort, and full effort. Low effort means pretty much out of the box. You know, just whatever, you, you can kind of click a few buttons and you're good to go, you move on. In the, in the middle, you're talking about um, things like doing some custom CSS or design manager, but you're talking about a little bit more complexity there. Um, in, in Dan and Jeremy's session earlier this morning, they, they kind of coined some of these other terms. So on the low effort, they're calling that out of the box. On the medium effort, we had configure and extend. And I think Dan even created some really cool graphics with, uh, with uh, using VW bugs. So um, he, he's, really, he's, he's really putting on his designer hat for that stuff. <laughs> and then on the top, we have the full effort. And that would be extend where you would kind of disguise the limit. But above that, I mean, you could just, I mean, really, if you, since we live down in Orlando, they like to say if you can, at Walt Disney, they like to say if you can dream it, you can do it. I mean, that same idea that uh, if you're talking about, um, you know, whatever type of experience you're thinking about, it's possible to deliver in SharePoint Online, but you have to think about, you know, what's involved. Do you have, uh, at the low effort, you're talking, you know, minutes or hours. In the middle, at the medium effort, you're talking maybe hours or days. And on the full effort, I mean, we, you could be talking days, weeks, months, just depending on how aggressive or complete your design is. So, you, you know, that, that's really important to think about as you're going through, you know, do you have, do you have the skill set? What is the implementation time? What is the value you're going to get out of, out of this? And, you know, as it relates to branding in SharePoint Online, you know, it's going to change the potential impact that, it, uh, that these UI changes, UX changes could have on the whole process. You know, how does it, uh, you, you know, compose looks are probably going to be pretty easy. Uh, you, you know, pretty easy to just pick a composed look and you're good to go. But, you know, if you're doing the higher impact stuff like the medium and uh, the medium and full, it could be a little bit harder. Yeah, I like to say the difference between the previous slide and this slide is the previous slide is 
you know, how much effort is it going to take to build it? On this slide, we're talking about what's the impact once you're in SharePoint Online to when changes come down, when things happen that you need to update. If you go to the left side, where you've got composed looks, you're really using out-of-the-box functionality to make your site, you know, have some colors, some fonts, logo, background image, that kind of thing. Really, nothing you could do there can hurt the upgrade process. And so Microsoft's always changing SharePoint Online. Probably once a week, something gets pushed out there. You'll be ready to go if you're going on that side. It's not on the slide, but probably uh, cascading style sheets. If you just did branding with cascading style sheets, you'd probably still be in the low impact side of things, although a little bit more things for you to think about going forward. When you move over to the high impact side, You've got uh, a feature called Design Manager, which I'll discuss in a little bit. And you've got what I consider full SharePoint branding, which is where you're making custom master pages and page layouts and all that stuff by hand. Um, if you're going to go to either of those things on that side, what you're ending up with is a master page that is uh, styling your site. We have a slide that talks a little bit about what a master page is a few slides from now. But just know that once you start uh, heading down that path, you've got more maintenance to worry about. And so just um, and so that's like the previous slide where we talked about publishing portals versus collaboration sites. You know, we like to keep our collaboration sites fairly simple. Our publishing portals we go crazy on sometimes. That's because we know we want to sort of mitigate that risk and say in the publishing portal, we're willing to accept the fact that we're going to keep that updated all the time. The collaboration sites, those we keep them simple. That way Microsoft makes sure they're always good to go as things get updated. Yeah, and I think uh, when we talk about the higher impact, we're also talking about more of, uh, you, you know, your level of risk goes up in terms of uh, there's more things that you can potentially mess up. You know, so we were talking about the idea of working on, uh, working on your car engine or something like that. You know, it's, you, you know, you're, you're, if I, you don't want me working on your car engine, but, uh, you know, if, if something, uh, you know, you got a little car's not running right or whatever, you pop the hood, you know, you don't want me working on, but you take it to someone who knows what they're doing, and, and you're good to go. And it's the same deal with, um, you know, with some of these more complex changes. The level of difficulty gets uh, gets harder, but also, uh, you, you know, the the potential for how you can uh, how you can kind of stub your toe gets a little bit uh, gets a little bit more great. Yep. So responsive web design. We feel like we had to have a slide in here to talk about that. How many people here are super excited to be doing responsive web design that kind of thing? Oh, man, come on, I'm excited about it. It's a really cool idea, uh, very popular. Almost all of our customers come to us and say, hey, we want our dang site to be responsive. How do we do that? Um, and the reason why everybody likes it is because you build, like, one design, and it applies to your site. And then if a small screen comes to your site, it responds, your design responds to that small screen. If a big screen comes to your site, it responds out to that. And so you have one code base that you uh, put all your effort into, and it's going to look nice no matter who goes to it. That's really cool. The downside to that, though, is, especially in SharePoint, is you need to start thinking about what that means uh, in your SharePoint site. And so something to think about would be, we recommend that you probably don't go full responsive on collaboration sites. Just because a lot of the features that are in SharePoint, you know, Gantt charts, various ways you can share lists and things like that, they really only go sort of so small. So you bring it up on your cell phone, you're going to have to fight a lot with CSS to make all that stuff fit properly. You're going to have to make a lot of hard decisions. You're going to have to do a lot of testing on various types of site definitions, things like that, uh, to, just to make sure everything works properly. And the, sort of the other thing to consider is um, they have a lot more content authors on collaboration sites. And so you need to make sure that the people that are using a responsive web design you know, they have some understanding of HTML and things like that, because if they put a giant image on the page and then you load that in your phone, it's going to look terrible, right? And so that's why we say it's better suited for a publishing portal to say, you want to go full responsive? Again, think publishing portal, think really putting a lot of effort into testing how everybody's going to look, different devices, different browsers, different parts of the page, all that kind of stuff. And then lastly, I threw in an example there. Uh, my friend Heather Solomon put together an interesting sort of experiment where she took the default master page, which is seattle.master, and made it responsive. And so you can check out that link there and you can maybe learn sort of how she does some of those things uh, in a responsive design. So now we're going to talk about uh, like some of the more details on some of those branding options that I just covered there. Um, on the left side, if you remember, in the easy world where things you don't have to worry about changes coming down the pipe, We've got composed looks, and uh, sometimes they're called themes. I'm not sure what the official name for them are, but I... Themes. Ah, themes. Well, the, bu <laughs> the button says composed looks. I call them composed looks. 
But uh, anyways, uh, essentially what you're doing there is you're, you can pick from predefined looks. Um, you can see on the right there's a bunch of crazy ones there. I don't know how many of them are actually appropriate for a business situation, but they are fun nonetheless. But the cool thing is you can actually go in and configure them a little bit as well. So you can change background image, change colors. You can change what's called the site layout, which uh, ends up swapping between two master pages on the back end. And you can change the fonts that are associated with it. And by doing all that, you've written no code and you've applied some style to your site. And I'll show you in a quick demo in a little bit how that works. If you go to the right side of that previous slide, to the more difficult side, we're talking about master pages. And why, why, is it, why does it make your maintenance more difficult if you go with a custom master page? It's because the master page really controls everything you see in SharePoint. Like the second you load SharePoint and the first pixel in the top right of the page loads and the bottom pixel in the bottom, the bottom right loads, you're, go, you're in a master page, right? And so it controls everything you see. It's got all the HTML layout. It's got JavaScript and jQuery, all the custom CSS, all the layout, hiding and showing and functionality in SharePoint, all the SharePoint controls. You see a bunch of registration tags at the top, which brings in functionality of SharePoint. And if you go in there and you start editing these things, you need to probably know what you're doing. So if you start removing some of that stuff, it might look like it works great, and then you load up, say, like a Gantt chart page or a groups page or one of those types of things, and it suddenly breaks. And that's the sort of thing you need to keep in mind as you start working with master pages. So in the, on the right side, there were kind of two ways to go, the design manager path and the custom branding path. So the design manager path, um, what you could do with it is it, you could take an HTML design, upload it, it'll convert it into a functioning master page, right? which sounds like a really cool feature, but the reality of it is it only gets you probably the first 15% of the way there. Then you still have a lot of work to do to sort of make that thing functional. Because if you see on the right there, I have a screen that shows you a design that I brought in that just only did the conversion part of it. And you'll see there's a big yellow box in the middle that kind of says content goes here. Now it's your job to go into something called the snippet gallery, pick a bunch of snippets, add them in there, and that's what adds things like navigation and search and content and left nav and all that kind of stuff gets put in there with snippets. Um, and, but at the end of the day, it's making a master page. And so I think of this as sort of like a simple way to kind of get started with SharePoint branding. But I really think if you're going to be doing a, a highly customized portal, you probably need to do it the manual way, which is what I talk about in the next slide. But the good thing about this method is you can use it for learning. So you could see what uh, the SharePoint does when you convert things over to a master page. See what it does when you add snippets in. Look at the, uh, the master page that gets created and kind of learn from it. Uh, that way you can see how things work. And then when, you're t when it's time to actually build your own custom branding, you want to do things the hard way, you know, really be able to make something nice, you're going to want to start from scratch and you're going to want to start from something like what we call a starter master page. And so I have some starter master pages I've uploaded to CodePlex, starter master pages codeplex.com where you can go up there and grab them and download them. And the nice thing about these is, you know, you could have started with one of the out of the box master pages and start editing it. But the problem is those don't have any comments or anything like that to help you. They are large and they have all the styling that Microsoft wants for, you know, the default uh, look and feel. So you have to remove all that and then futz with it and figure out where everything needs to go. In the starter ones, things are commented so you can figure out where, where things are, and it's also sort of just a white canvas to start your design. And so from there, once you've got your uh, starter master page, then you can start putting in layout. Like if you have an HTML design already, start taking the divs and things like that from the design, put them around the areas of functionality in the master page, add a bunch of custom CSS, add your images, make sure your SharePoint controls are where you want them to be, hide parts of functionality in SharePoint if you feel like you know, for some reason, you, the quick launch isn't needed in your portal, which a lot of times that's the case. You can hide it in a custom master page. Put all that together, you know, save, test, et cetera, and that's how you kind of get to the point of having a, a fully branded uh, SharePoint site. So here's a slide. I'm not going to go too far into this one. You can look at it later if you want to really dig into it. But it's just sort of a little decision matrix on when you would use Design Manager versus custom branding, the full, the full effort. And I think really uh, at this point, if you're going to take on, especially in SharePoint Online, if you're going to take on the, the tax of, of doing a full master page, I think you need to probably be in the custom branding side of things. Learn how to do it. Don't just use the design manager for your SharePoint Online one. That way you know when changes come down, this is what I need to change manually in it. 
All right, now I have a demo, which I'm going to do pretty quickly, so I make sure I give uh, Sham enough time to, uh, yep, I think uh, eight, actually. All right, you can see that. What I'm going to show you real quick is uh, themes or composed looks. I've got a site here, which has got a little bit of content in it, but basically this is your default SharePoint Online look and feel. Looks very much like an on-prem, except for it's got the waffle menu up here, which I'm still waiting on my royalties check for the, uh, giving them the idea of putting waffles into the UI, but <laughs> I don't know. It's never going to show up, I don't think. Um, and so what we need to do, though, is go up to the little gear up here, go to site settings. What we're going to do is we're going to go over here to change the look. And when you're in the change the look menu, you're going to see all these little options you have for picking things that kind of look a little bit crazy. Like this one is my favorite crazy one. The sea monster one, which might be good for your corporation if you're in the business of hunting sea monsters and <laughs> things like that. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to change it real quick. I'm going to try to make this something that's a little bit more relevant, at least to my interest, which is waffle, waffles. So we have a pretend company, which is my, my, my waffle company. And I have a photo here of like some breakfast items and like lemons and bacon and such. I'm going to upload that real quick. And that you can see it kind of puts it in the background there. Hard to see, but trust me, there's bacon involved in that. And then I can pick from colors. I, can, I have a bunch of different colors here. I can even add my own if I really want to. It involves uploading XML files to the server, so it's not um, super simple, but um, it can be done. I'm going to pick this one because it kind of matches with the oranges and such. And then the other thing you can do here is the site layout. It's called site layout here, but really what it's referring to is out-of-the-box master pages that Microsoft has provided, which there are two. There's Seattle and there's Oslo. If I hover over Seattle, you can see it's not really that great for my custom image. It kind of just shows it white with a little bit of um, transparency. Oslo is a little bit more fun for showing backgrounds, so I'm going to pick the Oslo one there. But the point is, that since those are out-of-the-box master pages, you can't really break anything by picking them. If I click Try It Out real quick, it's going to start and trying to apply it to my site. I can click this little thing to make it disappear. That's my favorite Easter egg in all of SharePoint. <laughs> I want to know how long the developer spent to make it so that I could click that thing and make it disappear right there. Shouldn't take long. Shouldn't take long. All right. There you go. <laughs> so it gives me a little preview. Look, it's all black. It's great. And then it'll go like that. And there's what it's going to look like. If I say yes, keep it, then it's going to do a little bit more thinking. It's going to apply it to my site. I've got it in there. The other thing I can do is I can change the logo real quick so that that looks nicer. And I can say from my computer, I'm going to choose a file. I've already got a transparent PNG I made. I'm going to pick that, upload it. And at that point, my site's pretty much ready to go. I've branded my site. I haven't done any custom code at all. Now, this is what it's going to look like, though. It's, this is the look right here. There's no footer. There's some navigation. There's a title area. There's a logo. If you really want to go crazy and change everything, you need a custom master page. And so what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to apply one. I'm not going to, we don't really have time for me to go into the inner workings of actually creating a master page and all that kind of stuff. But I just wanted to show you like the subtle difference for what happens if I apply a master page to my site here. And you might say, hey, you know, it looks pretty similar. The page content is the same. But what you'll see here is I've still got the, um, the, the ribbon at the top with the waffle menu and everything. But now I've completely changed how my nav works. I've moved my search over. I've removed the text for the title of the site right here. The content is now in a fixed width display because that's how uh, my company wanted it. And then if I scroll down here, there's a footer at the bottom with all of our information. That's something that a lot of people want to do in companies is have sort of your copyright and your footer, how to get help, where's the help desk, all that kind of jazz. You can't do that with a composed look. You have to go through the tax of doing a full master page. And I'll just show you, I'm not going to go into the details, but this is what it looks like, the code for a master page. So this is what you're getting involved in here is you need to be able to function and, and use this sort of thing to put together a custom master page. So that's a pretty brief demo, but I just wanted to show you some of the options that we have there. Thanks, Randy. That was awesome. Yeah. Oh, I went too far. Thanks. So we saw how Randy you know, changed the look of SharePoint and gave us options on what, what we can do all the way from composed looks or themes through to custom master pages. I want to start talking about performance and what we need to think through when we start doing these branding operations. But before I get into that, I want to spend a couple of minutes to talk through some of the common causes or behaviors that leads to slow performance in SharePoint Online. We get a lot of feedback from our customers, from our partners. We have hundreds of millions of page requests in the service every month, which gives us insights into how things work at scale. 
And we want to take some of those learnings and give it back as prescriptive guidance, which you can take back home and apply to your sites. So with that, top five causes of slow performance in SharePoint Online. Number one, structural navigation. This probably is the most common and has the most impact on performance. Navigation is pervasive. You see it on all pages. And if you get this wrong, the impact is pretty, it's throughout your uh, user experience, both for your end users as well as your administrators. Now, structural navigation is a feature that's available when you turn on publishing in your site collection. And what it does is it walks through your site hierarchy and dynamically generates a navigation which is security trimmed. And the work involved in generating this navigation depends on how many sites you have in your site collection and how deep they are. And to give you a sense of the work involved, every site we visit as part of our discovery, we end up making around eight SQL round trips. And it's not uncommon to have site, site collections with 100 or 200 sites. And if you do the math, that's around 1,600 SQL round trips as we do the work to render your page. One of the reasons, like you might be thinking, oh, don't you cache these things on the server? Isn't caching available? And the answer is yes, we do cache. However, because of the scale of SharePoint Online, and we don't have what we call as user affinity, like I think Randy touched on it during the session early, you could come, build up the cache on a box. However, for the subsequent request, we might send you off to another box, and you have to redo the entire process, paying the penalty. And we see this happen most often when you do a lift and shift migration from on-prem, because these features do work well on-prem because of your scale. However, when you lift and shift to share on online, things come undone. The next one is content roll-up. Again, super popular for portals. You, know, you go, go aggregate content from across your site and roll it up onto your homepage. A popular way of doing this is the content by query web part. Similar to the structural navigation, you can get content by query web part to make those expensive queries. Underneath the hood, they both leverage the same infrastructure and are heavily reliant on caching. So the short uh, takeaway is avoid relying on features that are dependent on server-side caching. And I'll talk about what options we've got. The next one is large files, especially images. This might seem pretty straightforward, like do not put large images on your file, on your homepage. But the reality is we see this time and again happening in the service. I'll give you a real life story. It was probably early last year. My colleague and me, we were, uh, we got, we had a big escalation come through from one of our large customers. We huddled up in our room and started going through figuring out what's going on. And what we noticed was a 12 meg image coming down as a background for the portal. <laughs> no matter how fat your internet pipe is, it is going to start affecting your uh, performance. It seems obvious. Unfortunately, it sneaks through, so keep an eye out on it. Lots of requests, especially JavaScript and CSS and images. With the move to the cloud, you know, there's a huge emphasis on client-side customizations, using jQuery and the various other JavaScript libraries to customize your portal. And I've seen some awesome functionality built using those tech, which is great. However, we also see this trend where pages are now making a lot of requests back to the server to download all these dependencies. So if you are customizing or you're working with developers who are customizing these pages, you need to be careful about how you get these dependencies to your users and be a bit smart about them. And I'll talk to you about some options. And finally, good old web paths. Now, everyone loves web paths. It's, it's a super cool feature in SharePoint. It allows you to move things around, quickly set it up. But if you are working on a portal that has a very high performance bar, you need to be asking yourself how many web parts go onto the page. Because every web part you add, we spend additional time on the server processing it. So think through, there are options that, which I'll talk, talk to you about how you can limit the use of web parts and be very conscious about it. Enough talking, Let, let's go into a demo and try and see how we can improve performance of a portal. It's eight, seven, sorry. Oops. So you would have seen you know, the, the demo portal in our booths. I've taken the same portal and done things to it.
to degrade performance on it. The team that built this have done a great work setting it up, but I've done some things to it to really degrade performance. So I'm just going to go quickly browse to that portal. I'm going to open up my trusty network timing tool and request my home page. You can see it's starting to spin. And when you see this, the first thing users ask me is like, is there something wrong with SharePoint Online? You know, it's taking a few seconds for it to load. The page isn't even responding. And I generally point them to say, how does OneDrive for Business stack up? Go browse your OneDrive for Business page. Click around a few times and tell me what the performance of your OneDrive for Business page is. That loaded pretty quickly. This thing's still spinning. Hey, Sean, if anybody was interested in looking at their own install or using a fancy tool or anything like that to show all the stuff at the bottom? This is just out-of-the-box <laughs> tools with your browsers. Most modern browsers have it. I'm using Chrome. IE has it. Firefox has it. Pick your tool of choice. And the reason why you show OneDrive is because you can't really customize it. It's just that's, a, that's the UI that's That's out-of-the-box, out yep. no customization. We use it a lot for our internal monitoring. And what you would notice is this page is loading in around 1.7 seconds. We also send, like, if you talk about Easter uh, egg, yeah, Easter eggs, there's a few more. We send down what we call as some response headers as part of our page response. And what this tells you, there's two. There's SPIS, latency, and request duration. Request duration specifically tells you the amount of time in milliseconds you spent on the SharePoint server processing the page. In this case, it was 134 milliseconds to go through the entire page lifecycle. It's all the way from authenticating the user, authorizing them, talking to the databases, talking to our cache, and sending the page back over the wire. 134 milliseconds. Oh, there you go. The page came back. And this, if you zoom in there, took 32 seconds to come back. And the reason, and if I just quick, quickly go through and show you the response for that page. Again, 30 odd seconds in SharePoint building up the page. And the reason we spent this time is because we're using structural navigation and I have it set up to go look up every site in my site collection and roll it up. So we're actually spending time building that navigation. Although this would have been cached on one of the servers that served this request, if I hit refresh, I probably might get bounced off to another server and I go through the process again. That was something that kind of blew my mind when you first mentioned it, because I'm so used to on-prem stuff. Once it's cached on-prem, you're, you're, you're pretty much cached, right? But, but in the, at SharePoint Online, you could, in fact, hit another server, have to rebuild that. So you yeah. need to use different techniques. I think one of the fundamental factors for scale is not storing a lot of state on the server. So we have this, uh, we, ha we make sure that there is no user affinity. And we also take machines in and out of rotation for various operational reasons. Yeah. So uh, what I'm going to do is like just disable my cache. So what this simulates is what I call as the first browse experience. You're basically browsing to the portal with an empty uh, cache. And this is where when you don't have good co connectivity to the internet or to the, uh, to the service, it starts uh, impacting performance. You can see I'm, I'm again spinning because I've gone off to another box in this case. And it's going to take a couple of seconds for it to come back. And just to, while we're doing that, if I refresh this, that page is still fast. OK, page comes back. Keep an eye out on the bottom left of the screen, where it's telling you the number of requests the page is making and the amount of data it's downloading. So we've got to close to 150 requests, 145 requests, and we've downloaded around 13 megs of data. This, on a poor connection, will be a horrendous experience. And what's happened is I've just simulated real-life scenarios in here. I've got these full-bleed images, and if I sc scroll through and look at that image, that's like a 1920 by 1080 pixel image resized in uh, HTML. So we're paying the price for download. This is where I was saying people do put big images on their web pages. So how do we go about optimizing this page? So the first thing you can do is just swap out your navigation to use what we call as managed navigation, which uses the term store to drive your navigation but we want it to be a cool demo. So we've got a custom navigation that's driven by search. So I'm just going to swap out my master page to use a uh, master page with a, with, with a different kind of navigation. Once that's applied, we just wait for it to 
He was the AOK. -okay. So in this one, you've actually created custom nav that pulls from this, the, uh, the search. Uh, this basically index. makes a query to the search index and says, give me all the sites in this uh, site collection, and I'll do my magic on the client side. So if I now go back to this page, I'm just going to go back to network, get rid of that, and just re-request the page. You'll notice that the page comes back much quicker, not as quickly as we would want it to, but it's not in the realm of 20 odd seconds. So in this case, we spent around eight seconds uh, loading up the page. It's still slow because this thing, this web part over here is a content by query web part which goes and looks for a specific content type in my site collection. What I have is another page which basically replicates the home page, but I've replaced that with what I call as the content by search web part. So we released this, uh, released this uh, web part last, I think early last year or, or probably 20, late 2013. 2013 and 20, then it made its way to SharePoint Online yeah. briefly after that. And the benefit with this web part, you can see in this case, if I refresh a couple of times, it's going to be much, it's going to be around the two to three second mark. There you go, if you're around 2.34 seconds loading the page. But the benefit of this web part is that we don't rely on making those expensive SQL queries. We go talk to the search index, and the results are now returned back in seconds. And in addition to that, we use what we call as client-side rendering. Since with content by query web part, you're on the server tweaking XSLT. With content by search web part, we are now, you can leverage all the JavaScript and HTML technologies on client-side to style it. What I've seen whenever I used to go into customers and they would talk about poor performance, I would see customers with not just one content query. I would potentially see customers that had four or five that were all doing very broad queries, and it's also doing the security trimming and the crawling and you know, pulling up very, you know, all documents that match a broad set of content types, and it's extremely expensive, even on on-prem. And, and we've done the same thing, and just to give you a benefit, that navigation out there is rendered using search. And, and it's since we make it from the client, if I refresh the page, you notice that the search control, the navigation control loads up on client side rather than server side. So we're caching it locally, much more snap, snappier experience for the user. Now I'm just going to look at what does the first, first load experience look on this page. Yeah. It's much faster. We're spending around three seconds uh, loading the page even for a user who's coming to the portal for the first time. The downloads are much smaller. We are no, no longer at the 13 meg. We are close to 8 meg. And if I scroll down, I've just replaced these images that we have at the bottom with more web-optimized images. I've just scaled them down to what resolution I want to use them to and just use them instead. So this is more of a education or guidance that you need to provide to your content authors to not get images from the internet and put them on your landing pages. <laughs> Big cat photos. Big cat photos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cat photos are popular. They're very mm -hmm. popular. So we said we're going to take it down to less than two seconds. And what I want to point out is, even though our pages are loading uh, in, a, in close to three seconds, there's still a lot of files coming down. And if you look, look at something like jQuery that I use in this case, it's like 800 and um, around close to a second to download. It's coming from my SharePoint server. Can we be smart about this? Can we make this faster? to help users who are on poor networks, who are far away or geographically dispersed, to still have good perf. So what I've got, I've got another master page, which tries to be a bit more smarter, smarter with the way we send down, or the way we talk to the server. I'm just, I'm just going to call it network optimized master page. Let that load up. Yeah. I have another page. Well, it's basically the third copy of the same page. I'm going to refresh it a couple of times just to make sure. Seems pretty fast to me. It's pretty fast. Let's give it, make sure that all the master pages have been applied correctly. And what you would notice, we are now at 1.96 seconds to load this page. We are under two seconds loading this page. And what did we do different in this case? And I want to disable my cache and sh show you a couple of things that we've done to, uh, to improve performance on this page. The first thing, if you go back to the previous page, that is, this is what the user sees when they browse, browse through the page. There's a lot of content, what we call below the fold. 
all of this content is below the fold and it does not the user, the user does not see it unless they scroll so what we have done with this master page is delay loaded all the content below the fold so we detected what content is below the fold all these images around 15 images and as we start browsing we we'll start seeing i'm starting to download these images and what this does is on your first browse to the page instead of downloading those 8 megs you really end up downloading a meg or two and as you start scrolling you start downloading images on demand and this is a huge performance win especially if you have users who are connecting to the, to our service and are dispersed and you have no control over their network bandwidth the other thing we've done is if i can get yeah, I'll probably refresh this page is we've taken some of our st static assets such as jquery and those various libraries and offloaded that to a cdn so we instead of these are, these are freely available. There's no reason for this to sit within SharePoint. Why don't you explain what a CDN is? So to to CDN basically are content delivery networks. How many of you are familiar with CDNs? Okay. Lots of people. Lots of people. Just check. <laughs> basically, it, it gives us the benefit of serving you the content from a node that's closer to you rather than coming all the way back to the SharePoint online data center. jQuery is a pretty popular, uh, pretty popular library. So what I've done instead of using instead of using SharePoint Online to serve our jQuery, I've just said go talk to the CDN and get it from the jQuery CDN. And you would notice, in this case, even with my cache disabled, it takes 99 milliseconds to get it done. And chances are users already have it cached. Chances are users website. already have it cached. So. We also did a couple of other small tricks to improve performance in here. We did something called as bundling. So I spoke about pages making a lot of requests. Oops, I actually navigated away. So one of the things we noticed is developers set up a lot of uh, modularized the code, use a lot of files to, spread up, to split up their content. However, from a browser's perspective, it doesn't matter. So what I've done is, in the, previous, in the previous page, I had like four or five requests going out for my responsive CSS. I've taken those four files, bundled it into one file, and minified it, and offloaded that to a CDN. So instead of now downloading five files, I just download one file that's compressed super quick from my CDN. And that's something that we learned whenever we were talking with you, was this idea that whenever you have all these hundreds of servers, that minimizing the amount of requests that you're making back and forth is going to really help maximize your performance, because you're reducing the potential latency from all, of, from all of those requests into one request. Yep. It all and, adds up. And just to wrap up, we started off with a 30-second page. Now we're at 857 milliseconds to load the page up. Can't complain about that. Let's and there's one more thing. There's one more thing. One more. Don't buy one it more. yet. <laughs> <laughs> so my tenancy is actually running out of our APAC data center, and I'm actually going over the internet to our APAC data center and back for this entire demo. This isn't running in a North American data center. To show you that even if you are geographically dispersed, if you do the right thing, you can make SharePoint Online be supercharged and be super fast. It's all the way to Asia. Now's the time to clap. <laughs> So we spoke about a lot of things. You know, we started off with a 30, 30 odd second page. I did some nasty things to it to bring it all the way down to two seconds. I'm not going to uh, go. Th I didn't. We didn't speak about how we did it, but what we have done is we've taken all this guidance. We have step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. One friendly URL, aka.ms/tune. Please go visit that site. We keep, try and keep it as updated as possible. It's also got all the code samples you require to get started. Uh, just. Now, I just want to quickly Here, run through. Switch back, I think. So, did everybody, oh. everybody get that? If you... It's aka.ms slash tune. I saw a lot of people go, oh. You can download the slides <laughs> later as well. They'll be available on, on the uh, MS uh, Ignite website, right? All right. So I want to quickly talk about capacity. You know, as you would have heard, Office 365 is one of the fast, is the fastest growing product in Microsoft history. And that curve is quite representative of that. Now, show of hands, how many of you were at the SharePoint conference last year in Vegas? Okay, awesome. There you go, a lot of folks. I want to give you a sense of how rapid or how steep the growth has been in the service. This is where we were on the curve 
at Vegas. And the 12 months since Vegas, we have grown 500% in the service. And this includes growth in team sites, one drive for business, portals, groups, you name it. And we continue to grow at this breakneck speed. To make sure we can keep up with this demand and have our current users have a good experience and make new users onboarding to the service have a delightful experience, we do this thing called this predictive capacity. This is how we ensure we have enough capacity to handle the load. So what, because SharePoint Online is so big, we get a fairly steady trend of requests when we aggregate over a number of farms. That's the blue line over there. It's a bit wriggly, but we can draw a growth curve off it and forecast off of that. And what we do is we buy enough hardware to satisfy the exponential curve, the, the orange dotted one. And we believe that this curve is on such a large sample size, variancy, even in the tens of thousands of users, will not budget too much. Now, that blue line is actually made up of all the requests in, in a farm in a zone. Zone is nothing but a, a container into which we deploy hardware and provision our farms. But if you look at the trend on requests per farm, it's a bit sporadic. Sometimes it goes up, it goes down, it stays flat. Farms are very organic. However, because of the scale, we get these efficiencies where we can forecast over a group of farm, a group of farms, which are predictable in the aggregate in the way in which they grow. This is how we go about making sure how much hardware we need, go through the procurement process, and land it in our data centers all over the world. Now, how do we go about allocating this infrastructure to the right farm? So we do. We look at a signal like this. This is front-end CPU over time in one of our production farms. I'm looking at a week's worth of data. And what we do is we, do, we draw these boundaries around them. We strive to run our servers, our front-end servers, at 40% utilization during peak hours. However, as the load on the farm increases, as organic growth increases, some of these machines start getting into the yellow zone or start warming up and start getting into the yellow zone. The service is underpinned by an, a huge amount of telemetry and monitoring that keeps an eye out on our entire operations. We have alerts and monitors that keep track of latencies in our service, availability, component level failures, quality of the service, and resource consumption. And our service fabric that actually helps us run this service can react to this by adding additional capacity to bring back our servers back into the green zone. So that if, as the load increases on the farm, we can react to it and be elastic in our capacity. And we do all of this without any human intervention. Now, one of the things we don't have on the slide is the scale. You know. Our farms range, uh, operate at thousands of requests per second. A large portal with lots of users generates something around 10 or 20 RPS, which in the scale of things is extremely small. So how do we launch on SharePoint Online? Like, and how do we, like a lot of customers come to like Phil and I, who is a peer of mine, and ask about, oh, we have a 10,000 user portal. We send the email out Monday morning. They're going to come hit SharePoint Online. Is that a good idea? I'm like, you send the email out. We can't do much now. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you have no option. But the other times, you can slow down and get some benefits out of it. And I want to talk about both of those very quickly. One is this thing that we notice. This is a phenomenon we notice every time we see large portal launches. One, you have this red line, which is the users you've invited to your portal. You've sent the email out, or you know are part of your directory, or are going to show up. And then the blue line, the active users, users who actually show up on day one. And what we always see is the red line is much, much higher than the blue line. Can the blue line get to the red line? Absolutely. If you do something like a massive DNS flip or do some group policy magic to load SharePoint Online as the default on 100,000 computers, you may get close to it. But organic load, you never get close to the invited line. I personally have been involved 
in, I've been lucky enough to be involved in large portal launches. I have one that comes to my mind, we had 110,000 users launching on Shepan Online. And what we saw was rolling out in stages or waves gives you the best chance of success. So what you would do is start off with something like a pilot launch. You have invite a group of users who you know will be engaged, who you trust to give feedback. Because it's not only about performance, you want to make sure the features, the functionality, the user experience is all top notch. And you want this feedback early in the life cycle. You incorporate them and then roll in waves and pausing in each wave to solicit more feedback. And what this gives you, it gives you like two key things. One, it gives you the ability to iterate on your design. And two, it gives you the confidence in feature, functionality, and performance as you start expanding out to a larger audience. But sometimes, you know, you just don't have an option for a slow rollout. So I want to give you a real life experience that we had internally on the SharePoint Online team to say why we can handle large rollouts as well. So internally at Microsoft, we work extensively with our Microsoft IT team. And we believe that if we can, if we can get it working for Microsoft internally, it will work for a lot of our customers, given the size and scale of Microsoft operations. So Academy Online, or Academy is a video portal hosted on SharePoint Online. We use it internally to view our training videos, view event videos like this one, and also for live uh, broadcasting some of our company-wide events. So this was one of the portals we worked with MSIT and applied a lot of the techniques that I spoke about to make those pages really light for SharePoint to serve out. So last year, when Satya was announced as the third CEO of Microsoft, we all got an invite internally saying, come meet your new CEO. It was sent out, it was scheduled at a time where a lot of Microsoft employees could come watch it. And the engineering team at MSIT, we knew we were going to expect a large amount of traffic coming, given how significant this event was. The short story is the event went on without a hitch. And we had an awesome session uh, where Satya spoke to the company. Now, what I want to point out is, this is requests per hour on the Microsoft online farm during the week of the webcast. And there are two colors. We have the blue, which are all the, re all the requests that were not related to the webcast. And we have the orange, which is probably 100,000 users jumping on to view this webcast. And what you would notice is that even though it was a very large set of users coming to uh, see this presentation, it still was a tiny fraction of the three and a half million requests the farm got in that hour. And this is what we see in most of our production farms. Even for large customers with a lot of usage, it is in the context of a service, it's still very small. So if you do believe or if you're confident that your site is highly performant, the features and functionality is work, and you've gone through the due diligence, you can go do the big launches and we can absorb it. So getting a new CEO only affected you guys that much in the, the chart? Yeah. It's not to scale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I'm just going to, uh, let's hand yeah, so, it back to John. Yeah, so I, I want to I talk about uh, a couple things. I mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation that we had a couple things that we wanted to make sure that, uh, that we announced at the end. Um, the first thing that uh, I wanted to kind of talk to everybody about is, from, every t from the second we were, Randy and I were asked to do the presentation, um, the first thing that came to our mind is, back in 2013, at last SharePoint conference, we heard lots of guidance that talked about don't customize master pages, composed looks are the, are the way to go. And so we had actually some conversations when we were telling people, come to our session on Thursday. And people joke with us, they're like, are you going to tell us that Microsoft's killing making custom master pages and branding? And we're like, ha, 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 no. But, um, you know, that was something that we were very clear about whenever we talked with, uh, whenever we talked with Sean, that we wanted to make sure we had a clear message. So there's even been some confusion this week in some of the announcements that have made, but we want to make sure we're very clear that Microsoft is committed to continue to deliver custom master pages in the future. Uh, and, and comments were, were made from both Sham and his team that, you know, without the ability to do custom master pages, my, or SharePoint would lose a lot of its value in a lot of people. So Microsoft is going to continue to invest in custom master page and custom branding and a lot of these things. But uh, there's been a number of sessions where, where we've talked about that stuff. But um, I, I told Sham, I said, 
I said, I'm going to come up here and I'll, and I'll say that, but I don't want everybody that's sitting there to just say, oh, John said that and Sham just nodded. So, Sham, <laughs> is what I'm saying no, true? Yeah. So, so, basically, like, custom master pages, a lot of people ask me, is it supported? Yes, it is supported. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're giving you more options. So I think, how many of you made it to uh, Dan and Jeremy's session before uh, this one, where we spoke about our new engineering, uh, new direction of portals? What we're doing is we're giving you more tools. Master, custom master pages on, is on one extreme of it, out of the box is in, on the other extreme. You have a big area in between where we're introducing new portals and the new technology. Now, custom master pages are fully supported. The only thing you need to take away is that it comes with an additional overhead of making sure that you keep, keep updated with our changes. That's the only thing you need to take away, that if you're going to invest in customizing your master pages, you need to make sure that you're on top as we start rolling out changes across the service. Yeah, and I think the, the John and Randy response is that, you know, SharePoint Online is going to continue to be a great platform to continue to make custom portal experiences, but you also have to consider, you know, the, the, uh, the resources that you, have in, that, you, that you have available to you and the techniques that you're using, because even with all of the changes, there's no way that, you know, they can guarantee right now 100% that any they're not going to make any change that's going to cause any problems or, or any blips. You just have to make sure that whatever changes you, you make, you have the ability. You have someone on staff that's able to look at stuff, or you have access to somebody that can make changes as needed. Yeah, think, uh, think through it, plan it. Don't just jump right into editing Seattle.master and say, oh, we're good to go if we're on SharePoint Online, because next week something could change. You know, make sure you're not the only person you know, working on this, that if, if you don't have a lot of experience with working with SharePoint branding, you know, make sure you understand how it works because uh, if something breaks or something changes, you're going to have to go in, edit things again, make sure they're updated on the site. And if you don't know how to do that, then your site could just be broken. You're going to call up Sham. Sham's going to tell you, all right, did you do custom branding on it? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, let's turn that off and see if it still works. Okay, you turn <laughs> it off. Site works. Okay, now it's your job. You've got to go fix He's not going to fix your branding for you. Yeah, so, I mean, the key takeaways in this session... SharePoint Online is a great platform to be able to create visually stunning portals that can create great experiences for your users. It's, if you're considering making the jump and you're wondering, you know, is this going to be a path that I can go down and, you know, is Microsoft going to shut me down? Absolutely not. SharePoint Online is a great place to continue to develop your custom portals. Um, highly performant, the dynamic scalability that people expect from, from cloud-based solutions is alive and well in SharePoint Online. All the stuff that, that Sham and his team are doing behind the scenes is just simply amazing. So, um, you know, it's a great place to have, have your portal, be able to take advantage of all of those things and, and create that extreme scale that, uh, that many of us are looking for to make sure that, uh, you know, my web page comes up uh, today and in the future. But, you know, make sure that you follow some of the techniques we talked about in order to take advantage of, you, you know, all of the great highly performant extreme scales that they have. Don't, don't work against all the great stuff that Microsoft is doing. Um, but that's it for everybody. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you.